Board to order. The Board will be considering tonight's agenda in the following order. First, the approval of the minutes from December 17, 2013. There will be an election of officers, followed by the normal high water line zoning ordinance amendment. There will be public comment on items not on tonight's agenda, followed by adjournment. So, first item, approval of the minutes. Uh, does anyone have any comments, any questions, omissions, changes to those minutes? Yes, Carol Ann. I just have one little picky thing. Mm -hmm. And in, under old business, in the very first sentence, it should be old Hayfield Lane, not old Hayfield. That is correct. <laughs> just so there's no confusion. That's it. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Then, at this point, would anyone like to make a motion on those, on that, um, on the make minutes? Make a motion. We accept the minutes as amended. Okay. Do I hear a second on that? Second. second. I'll, I'll go with Joe. I saw Joe. And um, any discussion then on the minutes? Okay. Um, all those in favor with the amendment? And that's unanimous. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is election of officers. Um, we'll be electing a chair for 2014 and a vice chair. So let's start off with the chair. Would anyone like to make a motion? Henry. To make a motion to be elected Victoria Olin Chair of the Cables of the Planning Board for this year. Thank you, Henry. Do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Peter. I, any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. That passes. Now we will be electing a vice chair. And would anyone like to make a motion? Henry. I'd like to uh, make a motion that we elect Lisa Quinn as the vice chair for Cape Elizabeth Planning Board for 2014 year. Thank you, Henry. Do I hear a second? Second. Oh, second. <laughs> okay. I saw Carol Ann. <laughs> and all those in favor? And that is unanimous also. Okay. Next item on our agenda is the normal high water line zoning ordinance amendment. <clears throat> Following a request from the code enforcement officer, the town council referred to the planning board a request to amend the definition of normal high water line, which is integral to the administration of shoreland zoning. The planning board tabled an amendment that would have adopting the state model definition back to a workshop followed by a public hearing. Uh, a revised zoning ordinance amendment has been scheduled with a public hearing for this evening. The item will be addressed as follows. The town planner will provide an overview, after which the public is welcome to comment on the amendment. And after public comment, the board will begin discussion and we will conclude with a motion for the board to consider. Maureen, do you have a sure. overview for us? Thank brief, you. brief overview. So um, what we have right now is a definition of the normal high water line of coastal waters and a definition of the normal high water line of inland waters. And the recommendation would be to replace those with a normal high water line definition. And that definition is, for the most part, what is the state definition. However, in that definition is embedded another definition of coastal wetland. So this would be a brand new definition. And coastal wetland is really that shoreland zoning setback from the ocean. And so the new definition really um, builds on the state's structure. And I say that because um, there's been a back and forth debate multiple times about do we stick to the state wording even if we're on board with the state meeting, do we stick to the wording or do we go with a wording that's easier and cleaner to understand? And I know you'll be debating that again tonight. But um, the original proposal that the planning board brought to the to the public was to basically adopt what the state is the State Department of Environmental Protection offers as standard language for shoreland zoning. And that was brought to a public hearing uh, last summer. Um, there was a lot of concern that using the state definition um, weakened what the town was currently using as a definition. So the planning board pulled it back um, and they came back with a, their original proposal was using the norm, the highest annual tide, which is what the state uses. Now um, this current proposal before you tonight, instead of using highest annual tide, uses highest astronomical tide. 
and highest astronomical tide is considered um, better because it's an average over a 19 year period so there's not this fluctuation from year to year you could pull a permit this year um, and next year you could be in violation you could be non-conforming even though you were conforming this year so there's some stability in that number it's a slightly higher um, elevation than the than highest annual tide because it's a stronger number the main geological survey is actually recommending that the DEP the state um, change their current definition to reference astronomical tide instead of annual tide so that's the first piece of the current definition that would be the setback from the ocean the second piece is trying to address the concerns that the town is weakening its current definition and what the town did was we brought in uh, Pete Slavinsky from the Maine Geological Survey who did a really informative presentation on the um, trend of sea level rise and information about experience with elevations during storm surges and elevation information based on updated uh, 100 year floodplain maps and the outcome of all of that was the planning board making a recommendation that we would use highest astronomical tide because it's a scientifically based number but then we would build on that an additional three feet of vertical elevation so that is supposed to address the concern that uh, we still uphold the town's policies for having a strict environmental regulation so that is basically what's before you tonight thank you You're welcome. At this point, then, I would like to open up the public hearing and would ask that anyone would, would like to address the board, please come forward. You do need to state your name and your address for the public record. George Foley, 9 Pilot Point Road. This new proposal would actually change over time our zoning without recognition on the part of the town. It would just simply change as the tides changed. Uh, I would like to suggest that you use GIS and just install our current maps in a GIS system. Uh, it's basically a, a geographic information system and it's used to manage, visualize, and analyze and reveal patterns and relationships in all forms of geographic data. The city of Lewiston uh, uses it for, the, for their infrastructure inventory, modeling, management, w drinking water, storm and sewer systems, uh, parcels and zoning, etc. It has a lot of cost savings. There's uh, uh, increase in efficiency, better decision making, improved communication, better record keeping, and uh, managing things geographically. It's currently in use by, like most other cities in the state, Biddeford, Brunswick, Elliott, Kittery, Lewiston, Lovell, Agunquit, Old Orchard Beach, Portland, a bunch of them. Uh, if we take our current existing maps as they are today and load them into a GIS system, it effectively eliminates Ben's issue with positioning where it is on the ground. He'll be able to sit at his desk, have the map supplied by the developer, see where it sits. It's just an overlay. It's another layer he can put on the map. Each one would come with the coordinates. He could position the thing, find out what the coordinate is, go out with a little GPS unit, stand on the ground and say, yep, it's right there. Okay, 75 feet that way is the end of the no build zone. 250 feet is the end of the um, shoreland protection zone. He could go to the other side of the shoreland protection zone and say, yep, right here. That's the coordinates. No issues finding it. I talked to Ben today and he said that the uh, geographic information system is in the works for Cape Elizabeth. Uh, he's already using a beta version and expects that the public version will be released in approximately three weeks or so. So basically what I'm saying is that the GIS that we're installing now and using now and will be public in about three weeks effectively renders this moot. You don't need to change any of our zoning. You can leave it alone, position the maps as they are, and Ben won't have any trouble finding out where he is on the ground. 
Um, yeah, a brief question, yeah. I mean, do you want to put this over? No. Well, I, I, unless it's something um, well, like, not to do with Ben, because he's not here. Well, I, it's something to do with that and their equity. I mean, that might be a positioning system, but I, I don't know where it relates to the ocean. Otherwise, okay, then we should save for later. Yeah, that I'll save for later. Okay, okay if you like. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My name is Richard Bryant, and I live at 55 Spurwink Avenue here in Cape with my family. Um, and I have some written materials I'd like to submit. I made a number of copies where I wasn't sure I was going to be here tonight. Um, this is a lengthier version of the oral presentation I'll give. I can pass Certainly. it out here. Yeah. So I did speak before the planning board, or for the planning board last year when you first considered the initial proposal to change the uh, normal high water definition to the state definition. I raised a couple points then, which I'll briefly go over. Um, the first was that the uh, state's definition is based upon a, um, a theoretical still water line. You in the ocean is a bathtub where you put water and it rises up and goes down. And it ignores all the real world effects of mechanical wave action uh, in terms of eroding um, shoreland and uh, the effect of salt spray upon the, upon the land. Um, all of those effects are already considered in the existing definition of uh, normal high water line of coastal waters, which is the apparent extreme limit of the effect of the tides, i.e. top of the bank, cliff, or beach above high tide. Um, the second point I raised was that the state's definition doesn't adequately address shoreline that's composed, composed of sloping exposed rocky ledge. It does a, uh, at least a coherent job of dealing with uh, marshlands, beaches, wetlands, in that nature. But when, when you're talking about coastlands that are a rocky, exposed rocky ledge like we have at various sections of Cape, the state's definition really doesn't address that clearly. In the same way that the uh, Cape's existing ordinance does address it by talking about the top of the bank. The third point I raised then was that the change would affect not just the 75 foot uh, building setback within the shoreland zone, uh, which the planning board seemed to be focusing on uh, initially, but it would also effectively shift the entire shoreland zone, the entire 250-foot shoreland zone oceanward, which would have the effect of reducing the area of land that's protected uh, under both the various use provisions in the shoreland zone, um, as well as the impervious surface cap of 20% within the shoreland zone. And the other two points I made back then were that I thought mapping was really important to project the effects of whatever changes you're making. I, don't, I didn't quite understand how you could uh, make a recommendation to the town council uh, about the particular definitions in front of you if you didn't have a graphic illustration of how those definitions would affect the shoreland zone as well as the 75-foot setback. Uh, and my last point at that point uh, was that one-size-fits-all definition would necessarily be under-inclusive of shorelands that are currently protected because that theoretical still water line has no logical connection to the purposes of the shoreland zoning, which are namely limiting the environmental effects on coastal waters of runoff and pollution from development on the adjacent land, and reducing the economic and safety risk arising from constructing buildings uh, next to the ocean. So since that time, I know that the board has done a lot of work and, and the town planner has done a lot of work and that you now have changed the proposal um, so that uh, you're now basing something on uh, highest astronomical tide, which I'm going to refer to as HAT, uh, plus three foot, uh, and you're combining the coastal inland water and the, or, and the, um, excuse me, the coastal normal high water line and the inland high water line into one definition. Uh, so, You've done a couple different things than you've been looking at before. I, I have, I think, four or five points to, to make here, which I'll do very briefly. The first is that what you're proposing to be doing uh, is, in fact, a change to the shoreland zone, and it will require, under our ordinances, as well as the state law, approval by the DEP to go into effect. Um, I can, in my letter, I cite the specific provisions of the ordinance that, that reference that. Um, the second is that this new proposed definition um, 
for normal high water uh, looks to be a, a definition limiting the baseline for establishing setbacks, but with the accompanying definitions, including this new definition of uh, coastal wetland, it's going to directly modify the shoreland zone, because the shoreland zone def is defined by reference to a term which will now have a specific reference within the definitional section of the overall ordinance, not in the shoreland section. Again, I, I have no objection to that clarifying definition, provided it doesn't effectively reduce the area that's protected by the current shoreland zone, at, and as shown on the map. Um, I still think that mapping is absolutely critical to understanding what this does. Unless you see how shifting the boundary of, to something based on hat, or hat plus one, or two, or three, whatever number you want, actually affects what's on the zoning map, which is officially adopted as a part of the zoning ordinance, which the law court has made clear is indeed a legislative enactment, I don't think that um, you can adequately make a, a reasonable representation to the board that this uh, pr provision is a recommended provision, because you don't know what's, what it's going to affect. So at least you ought to be looking at maps to see, gee, how does this change um, the shoreland zone? Um, with respect to administrative issues, I know that uh, the code enforcement officer's drive here has been to have a, a clear and consistent way to administer the shoreland zone, and I, I don't attribute any ill motives to him. Um, but I would, I would say that to the extent that the proposed new definition shifts the shoreland zone oceanward um, from what is currently shown on the map, then we're going to have a, a problem. And I would suggest to you that the most efficient way of, uh, of assuring compliance and enforcement of the shoreland zone is to have a broadly accessible map and have a common sense definition so that property owners can look at the map and can, if there's a question, they can look at the definition and determine whether their property is affected by the shoreland zone. And to me, the top of the bank is a very common sense definition it's been vetted by the law court as a legally acceptable definition, both in a case involving this town and in cases involving other towns. Um, and it seems to me that citizens, instead of having to go out and hire a surveyor to determine what hat is and where to measure the 250 feet, have a much easier uh, uh, task of determining whether the land is properly in the shoreland zone by looking at the zoning map and if they're on a rocky shore, determining where the top of the bank is. Um, the last point I'd speak to is that my focus has been on this notion of exposed rocky ledges, um, and I can't really say how the zoning would affect marshlands or other types of lands adjacent to coastal waters, but I do know that I'm, I'm absolutely certain that if you change the definition of the shoreland zone, that there will be those sections of the town where the shoreline is composed of sloping rocky ledges where you will effectively be shifting the shoreland zone seaward. And unless you're going to significantly increase the depth of the shoreland zone from 250 feet to something more, you're going to have a, a case in which there will be more land adjacent to the, the shore, which will, be, uh, li which will have restrictions lifted. So you will be able to put more than 20% impervious surface on it. <clears throat> and you'll be able to have land uses which are otherwise prohibited in the shoreland zone. So, in my letter, I've proposed what I think is a simple fix to that issue, to at least the issue that I've identified, which has to do with adding at the end of the definition of coastal wetland a provision that deals just with exposed rocky ledges. Um, and <laughs> you can make it as simple or as elaborate as you want, but my suggestion is, is as follows. In sections of shoreland characterized primarily by exposed sloping rocky ledge, and this is a place where the planning board might decide to point out on the map where those sections are, if you want to get that specific. Um, the coastal wetland shall extend to a line along the top of the exposed ledge. This line of exposed ledge along the top of a cliff or bank shall be determined without reference to occasional landward intrusions of exposed ledge within cuts or gullies, obviously caused by upland stormwater runoff, rather than the apparent effect of wave action or sea spray, which prevents the formation of an organic soil layer. So I think that that's a reasonable definition, which is pretty common sense. People can still identify top of the bank with respect to these rocky ledges. It's going to mesh with what your current zoning map is, so you don't have to amend the zoning map in that regard. And I would hope that you uh, consider that proposal. Again, I'm happy to answer any questions that any of you might have.
can I ask a yeah. question? Quick question. Okay. And can you pull your microphone down? To yes. Speak? Thank you. Um, so thank you for that presentation. Um, my understanding is that there is no a priori definition of exactly what the shoreland zone is until the code officer goes out and makes a determination based on the existing ordinance of where that is. So everything I've heard suggests that you're on shaky ground suggesting that the shoreland zone would move one way or the other based on this change. Do you, do you agree with that or disagree with that? I mean, I'll surprisingly, I disagree with that. <clears throat> In the first place, I'd say that you can't ignore the fact that the town council adopted the shore, excuse me, the zoning map as the official map of zoning in Cape Elizabeth. And you can find the sites to the sections in which that occurs. There are plenty of law court cases that make clear that the zoning map is a part of the ordinance and it's a legislative act. So there's been a determination by the town council that the shoreland zone goes upon the area which we consider the, the top of the bank. limited accuracy. I agree. And, and I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that uh, you will know down to the inch or the foot where that zone is. But I'm suggesting if your proposal makes a chain that shifts that zone 25 feet, 50 feet, that's a change to the zoning map, which I think has to go through a different but process. But how can you know that unless you go out and make a determination of where the entire shoreland zone is under our current ordinance? Well, I think you do it first by looking at the materials you have. As far as I can I know, I wasn't at your last workshop meeting, you folks have never attempted to superimpose the existing zoning map on, on either the town's GIS system or upon the Google or sat satellite imagery or any other method that's going to show you how the zones might change. And if it turns out we're talking a foot or two or five feet, I have no problem <coughs> at all. My issue is that just theoretically, it's, it makes perfect sense to me that if you shift the zone as the code enforcement officer has attended using a high tide line, which is not the top of the bank, we've seen instances in which that is 50, 75, sometimes over 100 feet difference from what the zoning map shows. And that's a big issue. Again, it doesn't affect every area of coastline, but it certainly does affect those areas of coastline that have a sloping rocky ledge down to the shore, where there is a definable top of the bank. So my suggestion is merely, let's, let's clarify the top of the bank so there's no issue whatsoever with that. I still think that 99 out of 100 people can go out on any property today where there's a cliff and say, that's the top of the bank. But this will give you a little more definition by avoiding those issues of gullies or cuts or uh, upland erosion as opposed to the effect of the tide, which is what our current ordinance talks about. Our current ordinance talks about the extreme, the apparent extreme limits of the effects of the tides above the normal tide line. Thank you. I'm going to cut you both off. And <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We'll continue I, that discussion, right. though. Did you have a specific question? Well, question? Because we will, I do want to continue this discussion. I'm not cutting off the discussion. We're we talking about a volatile subject, and if you don't hit it the moment it's done, it sort of semi passes. Can I just make. Is it a question, not a comment? It's a comment on what the gentleman said. Need to. About the top of the bank. Need to what? We're talking. May I? I can I clarify? It's Please just you're, you're in the middle can, of your public. Wait, yeah, wait a, you're in the middle of your public hearing. So. Okay, but I mean, I it raises questions that sort it, it, of need has, to be answered straight. He has away. raised questions. I, I do agree, and I do want to continue this discussion in the board from or, the board. Well, yes, Once maybe, again, not okay, making him our eighth <laughs> member. I'm not trying to usurp that. I just feel that the dynamic is lost a bit if it's just one-sided. I don't want it to be lost. I, I'm taking notes, trying to make sure that I do address what comes up. Okay, fine. And I, fine, I do fine. want you to capture your thought, and I specifically okay, will call on you, Henry, first when we begin our discussion. <laughs> it's all right. Okay, don't worry. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Hi. I'm Eric Martin of 45 Royalsboro Road in Durham, and I'm here in the capacity as a GIS consultant for the Citizens Environmental Coalition of Cape Elizabeth. And if you'll give me one second to get my technology. 
Yeah, I didn't quite catch what group you... Uh, I'm sorry? I didn't quite catch the group that you belong to. Or? The Citizens Environmental Coalition of Cape Elizabeth is the group that re retained my services. Thank you. Can, can you explain what that group is? Um, there I, might be others in the room to... more prepared to explain that than I, but I, okay, I believe many of the, those folks are sitting in the room here. Okay, thank you. One moment. Um, no, I didn't get his address. Uh, I have. You got it? Uh, 45 Wells Road in Durham. That's what I Okay. So this is, I think, a good segue from uh, the previous gentleman's talk um, because I've done uh, exactly what, what we've been talking about here. So what we're looking at in yellow here is the existing shoreland zoning of Cape Elizabeth um, as digitized by Judy Colby George at Spatial Alternatives up in Yarmouth. Um, and this was digit. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm having difficulty in here. I'm sorry. Um, so this is the existing shoreland zoning. And the point that I want to make right now is essentially that for better or worse, and I won't put a value judgment on it, what is being discussed is a, a big change. Um, so as it is now, we can zoom in here. The existing zoning starts at the top of the, uh, the cliffs and goes in 250 feet. And I will turn on now uh, 250 feet from the three feet above the highest astronomical tide. So 14.6 feet of the North American vertical datum of 1988 uh, is what forms the lower boundary here. So in this particular spot we're looking at, there's a difference of we could go in and measure it if we want to look at it or we could uh, spend as much time as we wanted. But there's differences in both directions throughout the town. And if you were to zoom out back to the scale of the whole town, you'll see some really substantial differences. Um, so again, it's a little hard to see on the screen there. Um, the blue here is based on hat plus three. So there's big areas here, and we can overlay the parcels if you're interested, big areas that will become part of shoreland zoning that aren't currently. And conversely, there'll be big areas that are currently part of the shoreland zoning that will no longer be. Um, around Great Pond, my understanding is there's a separate overlay, uh, but this whole area out here is not part of that separate overlay. Um, so at this really coarse scale of zoomed out at the whole town, there's big differences. And then if you zoom in and start looking you know, the previous gentleman spoke about a difference of 25 feet can be significant. And if you zoom in and look at the, the parcel scale here, um, you can see that that can have a big impact. So I'm going to turn on the parcels. Um, so here's a parcel that's currently virtually entirely within the shoreland zone. And now that it's, much of that's coming out of the shoreland zone. And if we turn on the 75 foot setback, you can see, you know, that obviously the same impact. Um, so again, not to put a value judgment on it, but for better or worse, it's a big change, that is the point that I wanted to make. Uh, and if there's any questions about the methods or the, what we're looking at here, I'm happy to <coughs> dive into that. Can I ask a really quick question? Just yeah, quick heard a couple across. of questions. <laughs> Go ahead. How did you establish the uh, existing shoreland zone? Yeah, so that was provided by Judy Colby George at Spatial Alternatives in Yarmouth. And my understanding is that that was digitized off of hand drawn maps uh, okay. using control points. Eliza, did I see your hand and then I'll go over oh, here? I had a similar question. Similar question? And over here? Do you have an error ratio on this? Uh, on, the, so on the existing zoning? On both. Um, the existing zoning, I don't. And in fact, I saw a memo that Judy put together that essentially says it's unquantifiable. It was, there's you know, several steps of that that were done by hand. And so to quantify that, uh, there's not really a way that she was comfortable doing it. Um, in terms of the hat plus three, I can say it's based off of the state's LIDAR data, the two meter digital elevation model, which has a root mean squared error vertical 15 centimeters. So it's pretty accurate. 
So the the hat, the revised uh, Shorelands Act here is what you're saying. The I'm saying that here. the the blue here, right? So the hat plus three, what we're looking at. Right, I'll turn off the others to avoid confusion. So that is based on the best publicly available data that we have. So you could go out and do a site survey, that would be more precise. But in terms of town-wide publicly available data, this is as good as it's going to get, in my opinion. So a site survey would be more precise? I, I would certainly, yes. <laughs> a, a, a surveyed point at a site-specific location will be more precise than this. And that's always going to be the case. I would not argue that. When you say hat, what does that stand for? Highest astronomical tide, but really in... Are you using highest astronomical because HAT is the abbreviation for high... It, it is. To, to be totally honest, it almost doesn't matter from my perspective because I took 14.6 feet of the North American vertical datum out of the documents. So call it hat, call it hat, but it's 14.6 feet of the vertical, the North American vertical datum. Okay, I just want to make sure we're using yep. the same yep. numbers. Yeah. Thank you. And there was a question. Over here? No. Okay. Question? No. Everyone all set with it? Oh, okay. Liza? Um, I think for the public, it would be interesting for you to show areas where we don't have cliffs and where we have low-lying land, like mm -hmm. Alwife's Brook or Pond Cove. Sure. Do you want to direct you me do to there? As a trend because I, too, have an issue with oh, yeah. shoreland zone as drawn. OK, so say again where, where you're at. So to the north on the shore. So I think, is that Alwife's Brook right there? Yeah. Yeah, yes. So, okay. And this is maybe a good spot to say something that is um, make sure that we're all interpreting this correctly. <coughs> so what I did to create this blue band of the Hat plus three shoreland zone is take, drew a contour line at 14.6 feet vertical and then buffered inland 250 feet from that. In the case like this, where this brook, the entire thing is below 14.6 feet. So implicit in this is that this whole area that is kind of, if you turn off the yellow here, you could say it's you know, this whole inside here is below 14.6, which I would presume to be part of the shoreland zone still. That's below that 14.6. Um, so this is a case where, again, the proposed zoning would be more restrictive and pick up a, you know, a bunch of parcels that are not currently zoned shoreland. Um, quick question. Is Allwife Brook um, affected by tidal waters? I, I don't know the answer to that. Only because the first part of it. because that's the definition, all tidal and subtitled lands, and then it goes on and on. So for that map to be accurate, and you're saying that there's a change there, I wanted to know because I'm not familiar. I haven't. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm not answer. familiar with whether it's tidal or not. Again, I was it would using... have to be tidal to fall under what we're talking about. OK. And you're familiar with it? Uh -huh. My understanding is. The part of Alwife's Brook or Alwife's Cove, which is part of Alwife's Brook, um, which is what Alwife's Brook feeds into, part of that is tidal. But all the stuff, the part that goes up towards the Great Pond is not. So we so have. You're saying that part of this is, would actually not be, that would be, be excluded because it's, even though it's below 14.6 feet, it's not tidal. Correct. Right, so that might not be tidal now. Could you go a little it farther north on Shore Road? Hold yeah. on, guys. No. <laughs> I, I missed Liza's question. Liza? Oh, I wanted him to go a little farther north to Pond Cove. In this area? I think so. Are you getting what you were looking for? Yeah. Mm -hmm different than what the maps we reviewed. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Hi, my name is Deborah Murphy and I live at 24 Pilot Point Road. 
and I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, the mapping. Uh, I will get to the validity of our current shoreland zoning map and the concerns that what you see in the data from Judy, Judy Colby George um, doesn't with this depiction doesn't map, match what we have on our current shoreland zoning map. So to do that, I'm going to hone in on an area, if I can. I might need your help, Eric, to, I want to get down to um, Surfside Road and Pilot Point Road. I'll show you what I want you to zoom in. Down in here. Okay. Right here. Right in here. And then I want it brought out so they can see. Okay. Right now, when you look at this line on Pilot Point Road, if you go into your zoning ordinance or come up here and you take a look, you will see that that is where it is. So to say that this data set that Judy Colby George provided isn't accurate, you could follow the shoreland zone and compare it to our map, and you'll find that what we have on this satellite map matches what we have. And I think that's really important. I think the other part is, so all, the, all of that yellow is land that would no longer be under the lot coverage restrictions of our protected shoreland zone, which would increase uh, the possibility of stormwater runoff because impervious surfaces are not measured outside of the shoreland zone. The only thing that's measured outside of the shoreland zone are building coverage, and that's at 25%. So that portion that was covered once before is not. And that little blip right there is about 111 feet at its, at its highest point. If you go further down onto Surfside Road, and I hope I'm, oh no, I'm down to Trundy, sorry. I'm too far. I'm too far, I'm sorry. You'll notice that there's a house right in here. Whoops, if I can get rid of that. This house right here on Surfside Road, it's the Underwoods house. Today, it's entirely within the shoreland zone. It is here also, it's <coughs> as it is here. The public uses that, we look at that, we buy property, we trust that. On here, it's the same thing. With what you're proposing, that specific data based on LIDAR, it's going to be outside of this shoreland zone significantly. Now to talk about the validity of the map, because there have been some questions about that. Shoreland zoning, the Mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act in Maine was based on guidelines put out by the DEP and the Chapter 1000 guidelines. Chapter 1000 addresses, and I'm going to talk about Chapter 1000, and then the State Planning Office's CEO training manual. <coughs> and also then go to references in our own ordinance. The Chapter 1000 guidelines state regarding to um, section, uh, let's see, section nine, uh, districts and zoning map. It does say that interpretation of district boundaries unless otherwise set forth on the official zoning map, set forth on the map. District boundary lines are property lines, the center lines of streets, roads, and rights of way, and the boundaries of the shoreline area as defined herein. Where uncertainty exists as to the exact location of the district boundary lines, the Board of Appeals shall be the final authority as to this location. And they make that decision based on our ordinance. So I'll keep going. There is a note of caution. Understand that the guidelines were created to help municipalities create their shoreland zoning um, way back when. Municipalities, but they still are valid today, 
municipalities are encouraged to incorporate specific, specific written descriptions of district boundaries into the ordinance so that disputes over district boundaries are minimized. The Maine Supreme Judicial Court has held that the official shoreland zoning map is the primary tool to which to refer in determining district boundaries under ordinances that are not more explicit in their district descriptions than the language of the guidelines, and that where there is inconsistency between the map and the general text descriptions of the shoreland districts as provided in the minimum guidelines, which is what CAPE has, the map prevails. So then I went further and I looked into the state planning office's um, training manual for the code enforcement officers. And it talks about the establishment of districts. And it says um, shoreland zoning is the division of a town shoreland area into various parts, districts with differing standards. Um, this is section three. Um, chapter 2, Section 3 on page 11 of that document. I'll send it to you. Um, therefore, a method of delineating the districts must be included in the ordinance. For example, a zoning map. Main law and the guidelines, Section 9, require that a map be drafted and incorporated into the ordinance regulating the shoreland zone. DEP encourages municipalities to also provide a detailed written description of district boundaries to minimize boundary disputes. This is usually the case where district boundaries follow a natural feature of land, such as a wetland, which cannot be precisely designated on the map. If there is a conflict between the map and a specific written description, the written description would prevail. For example, if the zoning map indicates that a particular lot, down to a lot level, is in the RP district, but the text states that the lot, for example, tax map 3, lot 12, is in the limited re, uh, residential district, the written description would prevail. But it's got to be very specific. And it's got to be shown on the map. The purpose of the zoning map is to apply, this is um, uh, Chapter 2, Section 5, pages 16 to 17 in the State Planning Office CEO Training Manual. Let's see, general provisions. A zoning provisions. A zoning map delineates the boundaries of the zoning districts on a base map of the municipality and labels each district clearly. Most municipal base maps show the boundary of the town, city, major water bodies, state, or town roads, and the names of permanent features, and it goes on. The purpose of a zoning map is to apply district boundaries and associated standards to, face, to the face of the earth in order for the municipal officials and the public to determine where the various zoning districts are located and to which properties the various districts apply. Um, there are special, special districts such as shoreland zoning districts, um, which we've been talking about tonight. The shoreland zoning map. The shoreland zoning law also requires that an official shoreland zoning map be a part of the municipal zoning ordinance, either combined on the same map or on separate sheets. The guidelines, section 9, require that the shoreland zoning districts in the municipality, and that's the chapter 1000 guidelines, be at, at scale of 1 to 2000, be clearly labeled on the official zoning, shoreland zoning map, be certified by a signature on one. So we talked about that down to a lot level, and then we go to our own ordinance based on the guidelines. It's language out of the, the guidelines. And I'm looking at 1921 delineates our zoning districts, the shoreland overlay or anything adjacent to coastal uh, waters um, is a separate district, district outside of the RP district. 19-22 talks about our zoning map, and some of the same language is there, that it uh, has to be certified. It's an official document in the ordinance. 19-24 talks about the boundaries. And it provides language on, basically out of the guidelines, and, and gives direction. This is in our CAPE ordinance. Section 19-24, location of district boundaries. The boundaries of the above districts 
are as shown on the zoning map, where the zoning map shows a zoning district boundary lines as following a public or private streets or ways, the center lines of such streets or ways shall be the boundary lines. Where district boundary lines are shown approximately on the location of existing property or lot lines, and the exact location of the boundaries of the district is not indicated by means of figures, distances, or otherwise described, the property or lot lines shall be the district boundary lines. And the the location of resource protection district goes even further. And they're very specific in that. So Shoreland would go on that. So when we're looking at this map, and we're looking at Pilot Point Road, for instance, and we're looking at 25 Pilot Point Road, today your code enforcement officer is using something less than the top of the bank and not looking at our current Shoreland zone. He's not keeping the boundary that shows on the street line because he's deciding to use something based on hack and he's on two properties because people have asked the boundary line that can't move that's on the map that has to if it's near a center line or near a lot line it stayed that's where it is has moved 62 feet to uh, to 82 feet towards the water that's the problem it's the current Shoreland zoning map has to be adhered to. It's an official map and there are directions on how to create it. It had to be clearly delineated and there are directions on how to use it. So when you have language that tells you, you know, if it lies close to a lot line or a center line, it sh that is where it is. There's no question. So if you move your starting point, you can't move that, but it's a 250 foot zone. So if you move it out towards the water and you can't move that, then can you really move it out towards the water if you don't depict it on your map? And I have to say, in the last several times I, I come, you guys have been great. You're all working very hard. I go to the workshops. The public can't speak at the workshops, um, but you can speak at a planning board meeting. The last planning board meeting, I urged you to please reach out to Peter Slavinsky, the state geologist that gave you the information. He offered in the town workshop when he did his presentation to provide you with exactly what we've provided here. But it took a citizens group to get this information to provide you with what we have currently to compare it to what's being proposed. Because at the time you were looking at hat, hat plus one, hat plus two, and hat plus three, and you weren't sure. But what Peter Slavinsky was charged to bring you at that workshop was only hat, hat plus one, hat plus two, hat plus three. You couldn't see what we have today to w know whether or not hat plus three was more or less restrictive, or better yet, where it was more or less restrictive. He also offered to incorporate slope, which would take into account the varied um, coastline that we have. As Mr. Bryant said, we don't have a consistent average slope around Cape Elizabeth. We don't have the same geologic or topographic um, features. We have flat, no slope. You know, if you're measuring from hat and it's a vertical measure, it's an elevation of the sea, for the public to understand this, you take that hat measurement, that elevation, and you go perpendicular to it, and where that horizontal line hits the shore, that's where your starting point is. Well, if it's really low slope, it's going to go on for quite a while. If it's a rocky ledge with lots of outcrops, if it hits an outcrop, it might stop right here at, at uh, 30 feet in, who knows. Five feet over, if there isn't an outcrop, it might come all the way to the top of the bank. Thirty plus years ago, our municipal office was, were faced with the decision to either accept the state minimum standard or not. It would have been a lot easier to accept the state minimum standard. And the state minimum standard was based on hat and elevation, just like highest astronomical tide. They chose not to, for a very good reason when you look at this map. If you go to an elevation method of measure, you're all over the place. 
and you can't protect some of the shoreline that's being protected today. And I would urge you that in those areas where there is such a big dif difference and where it actually it would be a violation of our ordinance to move it, like right here, that you've got to go back to the ordinance and you really have to understand that because if there's a worry about legal ramifications, I would say that this is a pretty big one. Um, if you move that boundary off of a property line or center line where it is close to now, how is that, how, how does the town, how is the town protected if you don't update the map? And I would say that if you want to keep the definition, I think we all want the same thing. I really do. I think that if we work together, we could, could come up with that. I think that we want to protect our shoreland zone. I've heard this board say over and over, we don't want to go to anything less restrictive. But if you don't see the current and compare it to what you're going to, you don't know. So now, this is some information. We'd be glad to, Eric can provide that with you, or you can go back to Peter Slavinsky and get it from Peter. It'll look the same. Um, so thank you very much. I appreciate all your time and energy. Uh, I appreciate all your hard work. I just think this is a really serious thing. And I read in the Cape Courier that what we're moving to is similar to what we have. Well, it, it, it isn't. I mean, it's got houses that are today in a shoreland zone that tomorrow won't be, and it has houses tomorrow that it, in the proposed change that are not in a shoreland zone that will be. So parcels, and um, like I said, it's, it's, if you overlaid this on there at the same scale, you'd find that the current is consistent with what we have on our map. So, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Sheila Mayberry, 30 Trendy Road. Uh, everything that Mr. Bryant uh, and um, um, Deb Murphy covered, uh, I really want to thank them because they put such a lot of hard work into trying to explain um, what is going on here. From a visual standpoint, it seems pretty obvious. I wrote something that goes over pretty much what they said, but I'll read it anyway. It is apparent from this demonstration that the board has not had the opportunity to review the impact the proposed definition has on the shoreland zoning district map. While the new definition includes the language that describes the overlay district, changing how high tide is calculated will impact where the boundary of the district falls. It is different than depicted on the maps. The shoreland overlay district boundary was created based upon the data points that are easily accessible by GPS or GIS. It takes into account the extreme limits of the tide. The new HAS plus three will have an impact on how setbacks are measured within the zoning district. If the new starting point is used without considering where it falls within the shoreland zoning district, then the map is being ignored. Setback requirements within the shoreland zoning district must be measured from the seaward boundary of the shoreland zoning district map. In essence, there is really no reason to find where the normal high tide, high water line is of, co of coastal waters is because it's already established by the shoreland overlay map. The map prevails, chapter 1000, section 9 of DEP guidelines. The shoreland performance overlay district applies to all land within 200 feet horizontal distance of the, and in case of the ocean, upland edge of a coastal wetland, including all areas affected by tidal action, such as cobble and sand beaches, mudflats, and rocky ledges. It does not say that it applies to all land within 250 feet of HAT plus three or HAST plus three. That is not what the definition of the overlay district says. 
this is your map, the map prevails. If you are going to change the language of the normal high water line in coastal wetlands, then you are going to have to change what defines the overlay district, and you are going to have to change the map. The other idea I had was about, what about overlaying the new flood maps? Don't we have a new flood map? What would that look like on, on a presentation like this? How would the new definition affect that? That would be an interesting to look at. I do not believe that this proposal is ready to go before the town council due to these serious issues that really have not been addressed very well. In my humble opinion, there is no need for a change in the definition of the high of the normal high water line for coastal wetlands. It already exists in the language of the ordinance and by examining the shore land overlay performance district map. The map prevails. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jim Mora from 5 Wombat Road. I'd like to summarize some points I made from the letter I sent in May. One of the reasons structures are not allowed in the 75-foot setback from the high water line is to limit household cleaners from getting into the ocean. Soaps, commonly used to clean windows, decks, and deck furniture, typically contain TSP or trisodium phosphate, commonly called phosphates. TSP is a fertilizer that enhances plant growth. TSP that reaches the ocean can cause algae blooms that limit sunlight to underlying plants and inhibits dissolved oxygen from reaching water below the algae bloom. This upsets the delicate balance of the ocean environment. The setback area allows for TSP to become incorporated into plants. The Cape Elizabeth coastal shoreline is largely ledge. Shoreline ledge contains minimal or no plants. TSP that reaches the shoreline ledge will in most cases get into the ocean. Shoreline ledge should not be included in a building structure setback area. A high water line that moves substantially inland from the top of the bank will increase water pollution from household cleaners. The proposed change moves the high water line inland from the top of the bank in my neighborhood of Shore Acres. For this reason, I do not support a change of the high water line from the top of the bank. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Maynard Murphy of 24 Pilot Point Road. I just want to add uh, something that Mrs. Murphy said. Uh, I just want to add to what Mrs. Murphy said earlier. Peter Sobinski also offered to locate the top of the bank for you. Okay, I want to ensure that Cape's current shoreland zoning district is not in any way replaced with something that would be less restrictive. Thirty years ago, Cape deliberately chose to create and enforce one of the most restrictive and protective shoreland zoning ordinances in the state of Maine. I'm aware of comments from the board and from the town planner that the recent appeals to the ZBA are believed to be because the top of the bank was enforced as the starting point of the shoreland zone, which is also the starting point of the coastal wetlands setback, the 75-foot setback. In fact, the opposite is true. The appeals were due to the fact that the code officer ignored the top of the bank and instead used HAT to determine where the zone starts. In the cases we saw, this HAT method was more damaging to our environment because it allows more lot coverage and therefore more runoff into the ocean. It was also less restrictive and therefore contrary to our ordinance, hence the appeals. Our ordinance instructs us to use top of the bank to locate the starting point of the coastal wetland setback and for good reasons. As Mrs. Murphy said, our town forefathers wrote the current definition citing top of the bank three decades ago or more. This board has stated, and I think the CEO has stated, that the top of the bank has not been used. In the early 80s, I guess it was, somebody wanted to build too close to the coastal wetland setback. The code enforcement officer correctly denied the permit application citing top of the bank. 
the property owner appealed to the ZBA and the law courts. The town fought hard and won the very well-known case of Mac versus the town of Cape Elizabeth. Were it not for that, there may be a house atop the rocky ledge known as Trundy Point today. If you want to see that top of the bank was used on plans in the shoreland zone, you can look at some of the files, including the West property on 22 Reef Road from 2002, the Chappelle property on Surfside Road in 2007, and the Goldman property on Pilot Point Road in 2005. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, could you repeat part of what you said? The, your last sentence, if you want to see, and then you listed some properties. If you want to see that top of the bank was used. Oh, so in all those cases, top of the bank was used. If you look at the plans, you'll see where it, it shows on the plan where the top of the bank is as a starting point for the setback. Okay, so those are examples where it was used. I, I could yes. Use it was one. Yeah. Okay. I am Kim Cripps, uh, 10 Pilot Point Road in the Shore Acres uh, neighborhood. Um, I just wanted to comment on the areas that uh, will become uh, more oceanward now. And with rising tides in the oceans, uh, I guess I just don't understand why you would put houses more in harm's way and allow them to be in a less restrictive area by moving that line. And when you hear other towns and cities like Portland um, kind of preparing for water levels rising, I, I think it's something we should uh, seriously look at um, and not allowing those houses to, become in a, to come in a more or less restrictive area. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Bruce Nelson at 890 uh, Shore Road. Um, I can tell you that I am extremely confused. I have uh, w looked at your, your uh, meeting on the computer where you discussed this uh, subject months ago, and uh, I met with the uh, code enforcement officer to see how it affects my property and uh, it is the it is very difficult to conclude what this actually does the way it's presented i i have lived at my site for 28 years i've lived on shore road in that area for almost 40 years uh, when I started, the, um, the area setback was 50 feet. Uh, some years later, it changed to 75 feet. In that area of Cape Elizabeth, it's totally developed. Uh, probably 99.9% .9 of the houses that would have been built have already been built. It's almost like we got two Cape Elizabeths here. We got this, the area that I live in, which goes basically from Bug Point in South Portland all the way to Portland Headlight to um, further down to Broad Cove. Everything there is up high. The My House, which has been there for 160 years now, has been in the exact same spot it has been through every hurricane and every uh, super tide that you might have imagined. It's still there, it, and it hasn't been affected negatively. It's m many feet back from the water, but it's behind the 75 feet. The good thing about this whole project is that you're finally coming up with a line that doesn't change with a code enforcement officer's interpretation 
uh, or a, um, a resident's review of what they think they have. Uh, that whole area is uh, already in a 250-foot setback uh, environment as far as the, uh, the, uh, the climate and so forth. So I'm very happy with it. It hasn't changed. I have photographs that show my, my front wall the same as it was 100 years ago. I have pictures of children sitting on the, the uh, grass in front of my house. And it hasn't changed a bit. Now, I'm sure a certain amount of, of uh, increase in the tide uh, over the next century will have some effect. But I, ha I am j just very confused as to what you're trying to achieve, at least in that half of Cape Elizabeth. The other half, which most of these people seem to be pointing to, is a, a different subject almost, because they're not up on a high rocks, and they're not in an area that, that is, well, they're in an area that maybe there'll be a little bit of change. I like the new idea of having an absolute line that both the state agrees to and that Cape Elizabeth agrees to. If it has no effect on my area and it has an effect on their area, you might look at it as two different areas and how that affects. Um, I think I've kind of said what I want and I still, to this minute, do not understand whether it's going to have much of an effect in my area. I do think it will change not the front, but I think it will change the back uh, because what it might do is extend going up vertically three feet may extend it this way 30 feet or it may affect nothing. I just can't figure it out and nobody can tell me. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak before I close the public hearing? Can I ask one question? Of the public? Yes. <laughs> yes, you can okay. ask one question. Uh, this is for the top of the bank people. Um, does any of you who talked about top of the bank have an idea of the difference in elevation? If this is the hat, the highest astronomical, and their top of bank is up here somewhere, what that difference is because in order to get 25 feet inward motion you have to have 25 foot separation there well I I can explain generally that uh, there is no clear answer it varies with the property which is and maybe right I know I understand I'm asking if you have any specific areas where you think where you have an elevation in mind for where the top of bank was yeah, I, well, certainly along the Pilot Point Road uh, area, yeah. there are maps in the planning office, as Mr. Murphy said, which where they've used the top of the bank in prior uh, permits for the development of those properties until the past couple of years when they started trying to use something else, and those are the things that have been appealed. Um, so I know that there are certainly within the town's records um, clear instances of a delineation on a survey map which again was a site, would be a site survey, not simply a zoning map, but a site survey that locates that top of the bank for a number of the properties along that surfside, uh, well, certainly along the pilot point um, area. I think that may be the case down at Two Lights, because if you look at this map, it seems, as a general rule, it seems that the property which uh, is facing the south, the shoreline facing the southeast, like here along Two Lights, uh, and here along Pilot Point, point Surfside. Point. I'm not sure about further I think Park House are the areas where I think that there's a significant difference between um, what the zoning map shows and what you'd have with HAT because you have a geology and topography that is these exposed slopes going down to the water. So it varies by property, but that would be my sense of the places that you'd identify that need where it'd be much easier to define top of the bank than it is to define HAT because it, it just doesn't make sense. 
Uh, let's thank you for the audience. Uh, I, it does vary. It would be depend on the property. But when I heard Mr. Foley tell us tonight, which I didn't realize, that the town is looking to go to GIS mapping, if we used our current Sherland zone as it is, you could use the GIS mapping and you float over the top and you get the coordinates. It's pretty darn good. On Surfside Avenue, there's I'm just, a... I'm just asking for a very specific oh, for instance of this is uh, one place where the top of bank was at this elevation. and I can tell you horizontally, but not elevation. Elevation, that one size fits all elevation, that's the problem. It just doesn't work very well in Cape because of our varied topography on the coastline. But I can tell you at 25 Pilot Point Road, the difference is 62 feet towards the water. That's significant. It takes a lot that's entirely within the zone today, and it moves it out by almost a third. So that's if that's lot. here and 62 feet back in space is the they, top of that. In bank. using hat, it moved shifted the entire shoreland zone. Right, but what I'm trying to understand. So the elevation, I can't, because the reason why 30 years ago a municipal officer said don't use an elevation, we're not going to, it would have been way easier for them not to do that, uh, to just accept the state minimum standard, but they did a lot of work and they said it just doesn't work. You're asking for an elevation and for it to fit, that, that's part of the problem. It just doesn't. And even Ben, when Ben McDougall was asking for a more specific starting point, he wanted to go horizontally. He didn't, elevation wasn't his favorite idea for that reason. So um, I, I don't believe I'm sticking him on that. But yeah, it would vary. So. And if I could just add to that a little bit. So the specific elevation, as I think you understand, in our blue proposed hat plus three is this lower edge is consistent the whole way around mm -hmm. and the lower edge of the existing shoreland zoning which is defined by the top of the, the cliffs is is different it's not consistent the whole way so i think to, to add to Deb's point it's going to be different in every parcel because it's not consistent all set joe yeah okay then i would like to end the public hearing at this point and um, before we do send it to the board, I, I do want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, all the people that came out on July 16th, December 17th to our regular meetings. Um, the letters that we have received. <clears throat> I appreciate um, we've had the opportunity to look over the DEP information brochure. And it is entitled, Establishing the Starting Point for Measurement of the Shoreland Zone and Related Setback Determinations. Um, we also looked at all the way up to the main Supreme Judicial Court appeal on the Mac case. Um, we read the code enforcement officer's letter to the town manager regarding his concerns of the de current definition. The code enforcement officer has attended our meetings. Um, we did have a, a memo from a GIS specialist regarding the origin and accuracy of shoreland zoning GIS data, and we did receive that presentation from Peter Slavinsky. Uh, he's a marine geologist, scientist with the Maine Geological Survey. Um, that was a very educational and beneficial meeting, and I would highly recommend, if given the opportunity to have Peter brought back, anyone that is interested in this topic should not miss Peter's informative presentation. So we have asked for, we've received, we've really delved into this, and we appreciate all the comments that we have heard. Um, at this time, though, I do want to open it up to the board. There, we have a lot of comments tonight. I do wish to address those. Henry, you're first. Yeah, listening to what was said, there seems to be a lot of confusion about vertical heights, which is a cliff, and if it comes, if the height height is here or here, really very little difference. But when you come to angle it down, which is the shoreline, which is on a low angle, 
the actual definition of using top of bank would be extremely difficult because it's not a solid line, it's a, a nice wide thing. But if you take elevation, the elevation is standard. It's, it's done by flying an airplane across the top with a known height, and LIDAR goes up and down and establishes all of the different heights that go through. Pretty new or newish type of technology. Airplane flies at a particular level, LIDAR goes down and measures on a particular line the exact height of that. And of course the shoreline is going to bend and rock and move and you're going to get variations along there. If you take the top of bank, whichever that is, you're going to get a, a line which can be interpreted, I don't know exactly how wide, but a fairly large, large line. It's like saying, where is the center of this line? It's gray here because the tide sometimes comes up here and there's that, and it's black here because this is somewhat there, but there's also another area which is occasionally reached. And highest astronomical tide tries to predict where it's going to be in the future, not where it was yesterday, because it's part of yesterday's assessment. Not where it is today, but where it's going to be tomorrow. And I noticed that when we were listening to Peter do his uh, presentation, that we had exactly the overlay we're talking about on a map, where we defined where, where, the, where the water was going to go somewhat inland. I say somewhat inland because the shore, the map is obviously dynamic. If the, if the, if the water never changes, then you're going to get an angle on a, a line on a map which isn't going to change, which on its own is an estimate because there's no exact line, regardless of what you think. If it's a shoreline and the water hits it, yes, there's a line. But if it's like that, the line varies from day to day. So any, any drawn map is as accurate as the day it was drawn, but that's it because it might be different tomorrow, it could be different the week after, and with rising tide, that angle, is, that line is going to change. But when we were given the presentation, we showed, he showed where rising tide, rising ocean, would in actual fact creep quite, quite the inland, and in one area, swamp, a particularly nasty piece of equipment which is called a sewerage plant and it would become useless. So you've now got a couple of million dollars or whatever to build a new, a new uh, sewerage plant plus all the damage that would be done. And so you, you can't come up with a definition which is accurate with, to everything, but you can come up with a definition that is consistent for interpretation. In other words, this is the line, you can stick a point in the ground, that's where this particular rule says this is where it is. And it's, and it's equal for everybody. And you do away with court cases because of, well, I reckon the line is over there, I reckon the line is here, and where actually is the line? That's, that's what appears to me that's happened during, during listening to what we've heard. How wide is a line on that map? When you blow that map up to the size of Cape Elizabeth, how wide is a line on there? It's a pencil line on the map, but it's 50 feet when you blow it up. That's the length of this room, I guess. I see somebody actually disagrees with me down there, but when you blow a line up, that's, you know, if you take a map and you scale it up, it becomes a very wide line. End of my conversation. Okay. Thank you, Henry. Okay, um, anyone have any comments? Or we can just kind of look at the comments we did receive and try to answer those. So how would you like to proceed? Does somebody? Go ahead, Peter. Well, I, <coughs> pardon me, I had a question I would probably direct it uh, to Maureen, <coughs> at least at first. Um, well, I think we've approached this as not trying to make the shoreland zoning less restrictive, if anything, possibly slightly more, and trying to achieve a ease of calculation. But the, the proponents of leave it like it is, who spoke quite eloquently tonight, seem to put a lot of uh, uh, Peter. I'm sorry. Seem to put a lot of uh, emphasis on the existing zoning map and the interpretive standards in the zoning ordinance, which they claim will drive the exact location of the line by streets, lot lines, and the like. Uh, I guess I'd always assume that if we did something, the zoning map itself on the zoning, uh, the shoreline overlay district would change. I have no map change proposal before you. 
the intent was to continue to interpret the map the way we had been interpreting it up mm -hmm. till this time, which is that the line would be dictated to in the field based on the definition in the ordinance. That is the way we already determine wetland, boundary, wet, wetland boundaries. Uh, we don't use the zoning map and scale it down to uh, identify where wetland boundaries lines are. And we don't use the map and scale it down for shoreline zoning boundary lines either. Well, in, if, if that projection they have is, is accurate, in some spots the difference is fairly slight. Mr. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Curry, I would, ch I would challenge the accuracy of that map. No, oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Fair, I mean, you know, bad data yep. does, I mean, you can. But uh, take as an example. I'm going I'm to take one, one line from the, our, our GIS consultant. Data, taking paper maps and making them digital does not in, increase their inherent accuracy. And so just because we've taken the best information we have available and digitized it doesn't mean that all of a sudden it's accurate. No, I understand that. I mean, some of the differences are quite small. And there's some areas such as Hale Life um, yep. where there's a dramatic new and, and uh, property I would, subject. I would love to address that because I think part of the issue is, again, you know, and, and, and I, I don't want to um, in any way indicate that the GIS consultant that's working for the neighborhood group did not provide a quality product. But your product is tied to the quality of your data. And it appears that all he did was take the elevation data that we have right now and project it onto the map. And you know we actually have pretty good two-foot contour information. But that doesn't mean that that two-foot contour informa information is better than an on-site survey. So first of all, you would have to adjust it for the survey. Second of all, it has to be tidally influenced waters. And I think all he did was take a, a contour. And then the third piece is, if you look at our zoning map, what you will see is in the area where he showed it was going to be brand new shoreland zoning, we currently have that area zoned as a resource protection one wetland. So almost that entire area that he's showing is already subject to very restrictive zoning because it is a low-lying area, but it's not shoreland zoning unless it's related to a high-value wetland. And so in that area, what we have is RP1 wetland zoning plus a 250-foot RP1 buffer. And I think as we went through the map, I could show you many instances where what he is showing as shoreland zoning, we actually treat as wetland protection zones. Thank you. There's probably, if we're correcting statements, could I take one more moment? Yes. The town is not about to launch a brand new GIS. We have GIS now, um, and we use it every day. We've had it since the 1990s. What we're about to launch is, it has been my goal for a long time to be able to make the current data that we have available, available to the public on the town website. Up until now, that required us buying a relatively expensive piece of software so that people could use the website as a viewer. And I could tell you some towns that already have that available. Well, last year we were able to find a relatively inexpensive piece of software. It's an app geo system. And that is what the code officer was talking about to, to the public. Um, it is a piece of software that we are currently beta testing right now. So he's using it at his desk. But all it is is viewer software of data layers that we already are using today. So it has the zoning on it. It has the open space and trails map. We've actually scanned in the deeds for the open space. So once we make that live to the public, a lot of the information that we've had in-house that people have been able to get in-house will now be available from your desktop. So that's not new information. And, and you know, the whole that South Portland and Portland and all these other towns are using this, my understanding from the code officer is, and from Pete Slavinsky in your own presentation is, you know, most of the people in the state are using the state definition for normal high water line. And if anything, the southern Maine communities are starting to look at adding a little bit more to that normal high water line definition in response to the sea level rise and climate change. I'll stop. 
Oh, yeah, I was just um, thinking about how, proposing of how we go forward. What do you think about going through each person who spoke and maybe addressing some of their points? I feel like so many of them require addressing and discussion. We've done a couple here, but I don't, I don't know how to organize our discussion. That's just one proposal. Does anyone else have a suggestion on addressing the public's concerns and questions as we, before we take a motion to the board? Sorry. You know, there's a lot of to and fro, and the, the way we organize the it's a presentation, and then afterwards we get to discuss it. But, and then, of course, you listen to Maureen, and you hear a lot of information that wasn't presented at the presentation from to and fro. So, I, being, having been a member of obviously sitting out there, looking in, it, it must be a little frustrating for them. To not, to not have the to and fro of a normal thing. So I wouldn't like to make a decision based today. I'd like to see it go on a little bit more with some of the comments that were done and, and us answering them as we've done, but possibly in writing or making it a little bit more uh, um, clear as to why we're going in a particular route. Yeah, it's <laughs> nothing. I'm sorry, I tell people to talk up and I just said that I, I mean, I, th I think that we ought to, some of the concerns that were raised obviously have been answered by Maureen. And rather than have people get frustrated, I would like to see our deliberations go on a little bit longer and more formal answering of some of the points that were raised rather than appear as if we just put our feet down on it and, and stamp on it. But I still think that we come up with a better, a better solution than was there beforehand. But I feel, at least personally, that some people may have grievances or fears or worries or concerns, and that I feel that it would be a little bit better if we answered them slower than fast. That's my opinion. What I mean. Are you, and are you proposing we answer those? We, are you proposing we answer those tonight, or are you proposing a table? Of the motion. If we've got time, some of them should be answered tonight, and Maureen's already answered quite a few of them, I believe. Okay. Um, so we'll there's others that, that haven't been answered I, that could be done relatively quickly. I think that that should be the case. If not, it should be left over, and we should answer the more formal statement. Okay. Well, I, I would. We have you all here. I would like to try to answer as many questions. And I I guess one of my concerns about going through this and purporting to answer questions in this kind of a one side speaks, then the planning board speaks, and I don't think we can go back and forth with any more dialogue tonight. We've tried to do that in the past. It simply doesn't work. But it looked like almost everyone who spoke tonight spoke from written notes. And I know from Richard Bryant, we have a copy of what you said. But before I would really feel that I could answer in any kind of depth what was presented, I would need to see it in writing, because I think there were a number of points. And I have lots of general impressions, but I don't have sufficiently detailed notes. So I would like an opportunity to be responsive to the public after we've seen presented in writing what was presented orally tonight, because I'm not sure that, we're in a, that we can completely answer each point that was made kind of going through it, and we can try in some general sense. So are you saying that, well, we have everyone, let's try to answer what we can, but what you heard tonight certainly has made you think about possibly tabling this to I think at the, at the end of that, at the end of whatever we can respond to tonight without any more back and forth, um, I see us going to tabling and taking a more in-depth look in writing at what the public presented tonight. And I know there was a proposal that you presented kind of towards the end um, and then taking it, taking it back to a workshop format. Okay. And that, that as, we, as we respond, um, that's kind of where we're going, that this is not a final response. Um, thoughts on this side about... I, I would go along with that. Try to, um, because in a workshop, you may not speak. 
So we would like to at least try to address some of what the concerns were. If we are bringing this back to a workshop, that gives you another chance to ask even further questions. Um, but I do want to address, I, I did hear a lot about the map, accuracy of the map. And I, I'm not sure if um, you had access to or read the memo we received from Judy Colby George dated January 16th. Um, but she does talk about the map. And she does say that the scale and accuracy of the data changed across um, every photo that they were taking, depending on the elevation shift, the tilt of the plane, when the photography was taken. And each individual tax sheet was then updated for any number of years without any control. So overall, she says the accuracy of the parcel data is unknown and unknowable. Um, but she does say 90% of the features must be within 40 feet of the location on the Earth, and 90% of the vertical features must be within one half contour interval of their actual elevation. However, um, the map could give you a false sense of accuracy. And any map which shows a variety of layers, and she's saying that these maps have been pictures taken, another picture, another picture. So she's talking about layers of maps, and she's saying, any map which shows a variety of layers cannot be, really be considered more accurate than its least accurate data layer. And um, she does question how accurate the map is. Um, and she does say, in the case of shoreland zoning, most of the data needs to be field verified. And the value of the type of data is for providing planning level information, which can then be used to provide general guidance to the town and land owners that they should be aware of a specific regulation and engage the proper specialist to map their specific property. So we are talking that, um, yes, we are talking about using a, a number, HAS plus three. But we also realize is that there is a vis um, an inspection that needs to be made on the ground. You need to get people out there and looking at the coastal wetland. And that we are asking to include in our ordinance a, a new definition that will be um, the DEP's definition of coastal wetland. We don't have coastal wetland in our zoning ordinance. If you pick it up, you won't find the term coastal wetland. So we are proposing to add that in. And it does talk about all title and subtitle lands, all lands with vegetation present. Now, of course, to see that vegetation present, you need to go out and field verify. You can't get that off a map. So even though a map may say here, and you see those salt tolerant uh, plants, it would be somewhere else. So as far as the mapping goes, it really does come down to you still need to get somebody down there boots on the ground and just field verify the information. And that now will be part of our definition because we are going to include coastal wetlands in our definition into the ordinance, which it doesn't appear right now. And I would say that is a positive thing. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other questions that we had. Um, I, I know somebody brought up a, a question about um, about um, are, are we going backwards and we're not being um, as strict. And when I was looking at this, um, and I, always, I think about um, the action of the waves, and um, Mr. Slavinsky noted that the um, state of Maine is proposing to adopt the highest astronomical tide as the elevation used to survey locate, once again survey locate, the upland edge of coastland wetlands, and that would be for the Natural Resource Protection Act and the Mandatory Shoreland Zoning Act. And so he's saying that line in, at Portland Head is 11.6 feet. Anything below 11.6 feet um, would not have minor coastal flooding. And so I wanted to know, what does minor coastal flooding mean? And I did find um, a report online that did talk about minor coastal flooding or what the other's floodings. And this was prepared by a uh, forecast officer from Gray, Maine, and, I had a, and it was also prepared by the Gulf of Maine Ocean Observing System. 
here in Portland, Maine, and they do talk about extreme tides, large battering waves. And it's this wave action, I think, when you keep talking about top of the bank, it's the wave action from the Matt case that they said, yes, the extreme edge could be this wave action. And so they talked about, in this um, paper, about wave action. And one of the things that hit me is a, first the definition of minor coastal flooding. Um, that's when um, the seawater briefly will submerge section of a near shore road or a low lying property and damage in water levels may be locally increased when you have large battering waves. Um, at a moderate coastal flood, which is just at 12.5 storm feet, um, you have um, coastal flooding becomes increasingly widespread. And then you have severe coastal flooding, which is at 13 feet. Uh, and at that point, beachfront homes can be lost to the sea and buoys are ripped from their moorings. It's, um, a severe coastal flooding is, is very um, destructive. And, and so the point of this paper, though, was talking about the um, battering waves, which is the extreme, I think, that people are trying to talk about when they talk about this issue. And it was saying the effects of extreme tides and large battering waves often lead to splashover. That's the term they're using, splashover. And it can be described as damage driven by large waves that are over top obstacles. And that can result in beach erosion and flooding and in significant damage. So when I look at some of these numbers, what's a moderate flood? What's a minor flood? What's a major? And I see that it's at 13 feet, a severe coastal flood, 13 feet. And then I go back to some of the data provided by Mr. Slavinsky, and he tells us what some of these 100-year storms are. 100-year storm is 14.1 feet in, in Portland. That would have to be adjusted for head, uh, Portland headlight. And then I go back and I read that a severe storm was the 13 feet. I do feel that this definition that we're using, that once again needs to be field verified, I do feel that the definition that we are using is building in by going up three additional feet. It is building for climate change. It is building in for this splash over that could occur if you are at the highest astronomical tide plus three it only occurs every 100 years, and that's at 14.1, and we're proposing to go up to 14.6. And don't forget, it changes. The, it changes. It's not a solid thing. I mean, as the years go by, that hat changes because it's reestablished every so often. Every 19 years. Yes. So when it comes to uh, the point I'm really trying to make is that we really have looked at this so that we are capturing those large battering waves um, by trying to build in those three feet. Uh, once again, we would capture any hundred year storm. And so we would also, if you look back at the storms that occur every year at 11.7 feet, we would capture those large battering waves that could come over uh, the bank. And so that's why I feel good that we are looking at this and we are trying to think about the extreme actions of the tide. Yeah, Liza, you want yeah. to add on that? Um, just with the radiator, I, I'd like to make a motion to um, table this for a workshop and discuss it. And I think that we can take the, um, the testimony from the public and distill it into a couple themes and have discussion around those themes because I think there were some recurring themes and some good points. But um, it's difficult to do that right now. I do realize that's a little loud, but I don't know how many of you can make the next workshop. And while we had most of you here, I did want to try to say this is some of the things that the board did look at. This is some of the considerations. Um, when we built in the three plus feet, we were thinking of um, pushing the houses back because we are concerned about hazards, hazards that can be man-made, such as pollutions, which cause algae bloom, and hazards that are not man-made, such as those large battering waves. 
So I just want to say that, yes, we can now, any further comment, we can uh, have that. I see, Joe, you want it. And then we can make a motion. But I did want to try to address some of the issues and the common themes that we're hearing tonight. Uh, I saw Joe first, then I'm going to call on Peter. Uh, well, I no motion. But before I do that, I just want to reiterate um, what Elaine said earlier. A lot of you spoke from written comments. Get those to us so we can really read them and distill them into the basic arguments. Um, the second thing I wanted to ask is uh, Maureen. At one point, Pete did say he could map the top of the bank. And we didn't press that too far, but he talked a little about some of the criteria, slope, uh, change of vegetation. That is not some, that is something that would still be really in the realm of resource mapping and would still need to be verified on the ground by a surveyor for yeah, and that, I mean, and identify that. Correctly. The other downside is that I've had lengthy conversations with the code officer on this, and based on the reading of the Mac case, it is his belief that you don't have to always use top of bank. The code officers. Yep. <laughs> the way it's currently written. Yes, yeah, it's currently written. Yeah. And I think I think you as a group, and I'm looking at Elaine read the even you read the court case and found that I think they they use top of bank on one side but not on the other side so if you want me to ask Pete to do that I can no okay I do I'm gonna go with Peter then yeah. this, this is just a clarification. <clears throat> Can we at our workshop amend our rules to permit some dialogue with I'm sorry, you're gonna have I to speak louder either. Speak right in. Can we uh, amend our own rules to permit at a workshop to have some dialogue with certain representatives of the public who've done a lot of homework, uh, Ms. Murphy and, and some of those? I, I would I would favor that myself, so there could be an interactive conversation on some of the points. Okay. Rather than doing that, if we feel we need more public dialogue, I would suggest we hold an additional public hearing, which we can always do. I think to, to change the work the, to change the workshop format probably isn't a very good precedent. But if we need additional public input, we could certainly schedule an additional public hearing whenever we wanted to. Um, but. Henry? One of the things it seemed if we had another public meeting and we had written questions presented before, so rather than have a presentation, the presentations were presented paperwise so that we could answer the specific questions at the general meeting. That might be a little bit easier. Oh, and we have done that. I've had people write letters and I will actually take out the letter and I'll say we have the following questions and I have gone right through it. Just once again, I want to make sure people recognize and realize and we're trying to acknowledge you are being heard and we are really trying to do the best with all this information that we are receiving. And so yes, if you do have specific questions, go ahead, put them in writing and we will try to answer them. Exercise the logic and say this is the logic behind the answer. Any other comments? I guess just, I'm not sure, Joe, if you were suggesting that we do go ahead and ask Peter to map the top of no, the... No, I don't want, I'm not interested in having a map. I'm interested okay. in a more qualitative question of, I mean, somebody brought up the fact that there's a 62-foot difference between uh, mark based on hat and based on top of bank. And... I've walked along a lot of coasts here in Cape Elizabeth. I just visually find that very hard to believe. It just mathematically doesn't make a lot of sense to me unless you have a very long, shallow slope. But it also could be that the map was inaccurate. That's more That's likely. More likely so, the map was I mean, inaccurate. my question to Pete was what are, you know, if you were to look at top of bank in maybe two or three key places, would that and it would be hard to pick the place. We, we tried that. We, we, when I went, and, and it didn't go over well. 
I mean, the code officer repudiated the work that was done. Part of the problem, I, I, too, is survey? we don't really know what the, what's the... We tried to use, we tried to use Fort Williams, and we looked at the beach and the adjutting cliff, and I showed you an elevation. You remember it. Good. Thank you. It's not in my mind. And, and you know, it, it didn't go well, and, and all, it, all that exercise did was show that there seems to be multiple ways to interpret the current definition. What does top of bank mean? Is that that was part That's of the exactly, problem? Well, that is exactly the road you went down. Yeah. So I understand the desire to know what the difference is, but the problem is that we, we don't seem to have agreement on where the starting point is. I mean, has anybody developed a highly definitive definition of top of bank or no. objective? I'm sure you could get many people to develop that for you, but okay. the only one that counts is the one the code officer is willing to use. And Elaine. I think one of the things we're trying to do here, and there have been a number of court cases that have been alluded to tonight, um, and you know people can read those cases very differently, but it seems to me that one of the things that the court has told us is that our ordinance gives the code officer fairly wide latitude in defining the starting point for the shoreland zone in any given area. Um, and I think what we are trying to do here is to reduce that latitude so that we have a definition that's clear from the ordinance. One of the speakers, and maybe more than one, talked quite a bit about the fact that, you know, going through in detail what, what the ordinances and the DEP regulations tell you to do if you have an ambiguity between the written language of the ordinance and a map. And what it says is, if the language is ambiguous, the map controls. But what we've heard is that maps are inherently inaccurate. So what we're trying to do is to avoid ever being in that situation where the language is ambiguous. We're trying to do away with the ambiguous language so we don't have to rely on the inevitably inaccurate general map. We're trying to develop specific language so that on any particular site you can draw an accurate map where there is no ambiguity as to where the line is supposed to be. So I appreciate all of this sort of code analysis that happened here tonight. What we're trying to do is to avoid ever being in the situation where you have to rely on the fairly inaccurate map because your code language is ambiguous. So I think we're we're trying to resolve that problem so that we never have to say which trumps, is it the language or is it the map, because the language is unclear. We're trying to make the language clear. So I think that's just kind of my perspective on why some of the comments tonight seem to be missing part of, of what we're trying to do. And, and if I've misinterpreted anyone's comments, I would invite you to submit them again in writing, and I'm sure we'll have other public forums as well. Any further comment from the board? <clears throat> motion for the board to consider? Did you, did you already make a motion or? I'd like to table this until the next workshop. Okay, so we have a motion. Do we have a second on that second. motion? <coughs> okay, we have a motion to table this to the next workshop. Any comment on the motion? All those um, would like to table this? Okay, all those opposed? Caroline opposed? We will then be tabling this motion until our next workshop. Uh, you happen to have that? February 4th. February 4th will be our next workshop. And please, we do invite your written comment so that we can have it in front of us. And if we do have an, our own expert at the table, we could ask those questions to our expert also. But no promises that. Well, Peter Slavinsky or anything like that will occur, but just wanted to let you know. So thank you very much. Okay. Last item on our agenda is to adjourn. Do I have a motion to adjourn it? Thank you. I'll Karen. second that. Thank you, Carol Ann. And all those that would like to adjourn, it is unanimous. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. <laughs>